We're discussing the state of gender equity and equality in Nevada. That's coming up on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt, Cashman Equipment, Valley Electric Association, and additional supporting sponsors. Well, welcome, I'm Kip Bortenberger, and thank you as always for joining our discussion this week on Nevada Week. Well, Nevada pioneered early gender equality by granting women the right to vote in 1914. That was six years before the U.S. Constitution granted the same right. Well, now, more than 100 years later, how are we faring on key indicators? Things like equal pay, political representation, civic engagement, and even equitability in education. Outside of this, do we have the right systems in place to hear all perspectives and values? And furthermore, how do these things inform decision making? Well, that is a lot of questions, and luckily we have a great panel to help us answer some of these. Please welcome. Nevada State Senator Melody Scheibel, Dr. Javon Johnson, Assistant Professor of Interdisciplinary Gender and Ethnic Studies at UNLV, Todd Story, Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Nevada, and Sabrina Bernabe, Advocacy Services Coordinator for Gender Justice Nevada. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Todd, I want to start with you. Let's, let's talk about maybe something that is maybe the easiest to measure here, equal pay. Mm -hmm. Where are we as a state? So Nevada has passed laws to make pay equity and ensure that gender equity is across the board when it comes to pay with private employers, state employers throughout the state of Nevada. And so we are able to, um, I think, lead the country in that effort. Certainly um, there can be discrepancies, but here in Nevada we have led in, in the country to ensure that we have gender and pay equity. And I know at a national level, we hear 80 cents to the dollar, um, female to male. Are our ratios better than that? Um, the, the specific exact ratios, um, I don't know exactly where that falls out, but I know that Nevada um, has led in ensuring that we do have pay equity. Um, we have, across the board, as you indicated, even with the right to vote, led um, when it comes to legislation and certainly policy and ensuring that, that we have equity when it comes to gender in Nevada. Now we talk about gender and female population specifically and we start talking about um, different uh, ethnic and racial backgrounds too. Um, how have we seen those ratios? Are the, the gaps widening or are they the same as um, not depending on race or, or ethnicity related to gender? When it comes to the, the breakdown of the population in Nevada, um, we are a microcosm of the country and so this is why we're getting uh, a lot of attention when it comes to the presidential campaign. We're seeing candidates come here in overwhelming numbers. It's something that uh, Nevada has been at the forefront in establishing these types of rights and policies throughout the state. But you can see because of the makeup of our population, um, our significant Hispanic population, but also our significant African American population, and the, the growing Asian population. And all of those factors are having positive effects throughout the state, certainly um, on our policies across the board, but also when it comes to, to gender and pay equity. Sabrina, let's talk a little bit about uh, representation in jobs or sectors. Are there certain sectors that we're seeing huge gender gaps? Well, I mean, I want to say, first of all, uh, as, as someone who works within the LGBT community a lot, when we're talking about these very uh, rigid concepts of men and women, I think one of the things we're constantly leaving out of the conversation is how we're defining women. Mm -hmm. Are we defining women as trans women? Are we talking about non-binary folks? Are we talking about folks like myself who are gender non-conforming? And when we look at discrimination within the workplace, um, yes, of course, there's still dis discrimination against women. There's still a gender pay gap with women, but it's even more so and even more uh, horrific when we're looking at trans women. We look at their safety in the workplace. We look at their um, their employment and things and things like that. So, um, I mean, to answer your question, um, yes, but also we need to look at how how we're defining that because they're the folks in my community are being left out of the conversation. We're barely background noise when we're talking about um, workplace discrimination and opportunity for advancement and all of those things. Yeah. So I want to bring that to the conversation. Absolutely. Well. And the populations you're working with, do we know how, how much wider the gap is? We're not just talking about male-female here. 
Um, I can tell you, as far as safety goes, I mean, and this is just, to me, this is kind of an astronomical number that, um, that when we look at corporations and we look at how they're being with their employees, that 47% of, of gay folks at work feel unsafe, 90% of trans folks at work feel unsafe. And so this goes to how they can advance at work, how they can thrive at work, um, what they get paid at work, how employed they are. Um, and so we see 30% less pay with the trans community because they're not able to thrive at work. So it's even worse than the pay gap between just men and women in my community, mm -hmm. and especially if they're in more than one of those groups. So I'm a female, but I'm also a gender nonconforming female, so now I have all those things going against me if I'm in a workplace where I'm being compared to men and their salaries. Javon, let's talk a little about historical and social context here. I mean, why do we have some of these gaps? Why, why are they still wide? And even when we're looking at just, at just pay gaps, why haven't we been able to close those yet? I think, if, if I'm being completely honest, I think part of it has to do with capitalism as, as, as a metrics for trying to understand how equality functions. Um, capitalism is born alongside of, of slavery. It's born alongside of race and racism, and we have to be honest about that, which is to say that as a black person, I was an object that capitalism was built on. I was never assumed to be a subject by which who was to use capitalism, but rather capitalism was to use me, or particularly certain folks, i.e. white, uh, uh, cis het uh, men would be able to use me as an object uh, uh, to, to, to further sort of uh, capital gains, right? Um, with that being said, I think part of it is capitalism has never really been able to imagine certain folks participating, or as Fred Moten quips in one of his books, the object learning to speak back, right? And that becomes a different kind of engagement. It's sort of the, the I think part of that is the racial and gender sort of discussion that Marx leaves out in his critique of capitalism that other folks have come along. And so part of it is, uh, to, to sort of answer in short, I think we have to imagine some other new ways of thinking about this, though finances is a very real material thing that we need to attend to as well, if that makes sense. It does make sense, and it's interesting because when we're just talking just basically about finance and capitalism, mm -hmm. right, when you look at just the economic impact of not having uh, equal pay, of mm -hmm. what that means to our economy and both money that's going in, but also taxable income as well, if we do have any type of gap, no matter what gender identity we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Melanie, 80th legislation just ended. Uh, we, we've had a great conversation already here on this show. What have we seen uh, both in the 80th legislation, the previous legislative session in 2017, um, related to gender identity and gender issues? There is kind of a myth that I want to dispel, which is that um, when we achieved our first female majority legislature here in Nevada, that we all got up to Carson City and sat around the table and talked about tampons and birth control all day. Because <laughs> That's not what we did. Um, having women in the legislature is not just about passing policies that affect women, but about tapping into all of the talent here in Nevada. So I like to think about it this way. Um, in the entire state of Nevada, there are three million people, and we're gonna pick just two, just two, to chair the major money committees that are going to oversee the budgets for every agency in our state. And right now, both of those people are women. If we lived in a time, in a place, in a society where we were only choosing between men, we would have cut in half the pool of talent that we were looking at to fill those two seats. And so when you start including women in the conversation, mm. you, you access a whole other pool of talent. And um, I think that Sabrina al already hit on this point so perfectly that we can't talk about women without talking about trans women. Mm. Um, because even still, we're reaching a certain part of the population that hasn't been tapped before in terms of a talent pool, but we have so far to go in terms of including um, women of color and trans people, and especially trans folks of color, and ensuring that they are in positions of power in order to continue to expand our conversation and move forward. Good public policy, not just as it relates to women and not just as it relates to gender politics, but as it relates to our community as a whole. Well, let's talk about the 80th legislative session with an all-female and a majority. What kind of bills did we see, and did we have success in really improving where gender inclusivity has gone? Sure, I think we improved <laughs> gender inclusivity, but we also passed um, collective bargaining for state workers for the first time in Nevada history, and that was monumental. Mm -hmm. And that was a policy position that men have taken for decades, that women have taken for decades, and, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to your viewers to decide whether or not there's a correlation, but our female majority 
with a go Democratic governor, we got that passed. Mm -hmm. um, this was also the first year that we saw major criminal justice reform. Um, we have adjusted the schedule for um, controlled substances by a huge amount to ensure that people who are walking around with a small amount of drugs, um, the amount that would fit you know, in the palm of my hand, aren't slapped with trafficking charges that carry a life prison sentence. Um, that's something that we changed this year. Um, we also made great strides in health care for all Nevadans, and we codified certain protections that are in the Affordable Care Act to make sure that no matter what happens on the federal level, Nevadans are not going to be deprived of their health care benefits just because they have a pre-existing condition. So I think all of those are really important policies that we put into place this year, in addition to the work that we did ensuring that Kids um, of every gender identity are protected at school, um, of advancing the constitutional amendment to enshrine uh, same-sex marriage as valid in our Constitution. And um, personally, I, I worked on a bill to end gay and pa trans panic defenses in um, criminal settings. So I think we, we see, we certainly see some um, policy specific to gender issues, but I just want to make sure that we're not so focused on the fact that we're women that we miss out on the fact that we were an incredibly dynamic and mm. successful group of lawmakers. And you mentioned uh, gay marriage is, is going to be on the, the ballot in 2020. Todd, what do you think? Do you think that'll pass? Yes, absolutely. I do think it will pass. Um, it's something that's long overdue. Obviously, we achieved marriage equality with the Supreme Court decision in Obergefell in 2015, the Ninth Circuit in 2014 with Subchick versus Sandoval. And now we're just going to clean up the Constitution. We need to go in and change that language to reflect the legal reality that we have um, across the country, here in Nevada especially. And we'll do that through AJR 2 on the ballot in 2020. We also have SJR 8, which amends the Constitution to, um, and, and certainly Senator Scheibel was one of the sponsors of that effort as well. Um, and to have that added to the Constitution and make it equal for gender um, and across the board for LGBT and gender identity as well. Yeah. One thing, if I could, I yeah, just wanted please. to jump back to the question about pay equity. So the, the pay equity um, issue, I think, is important. But the one thing that we're missing, and it's been touched on, is that you also have trans women, you have trans women of color who may not even be in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's the larger question than the pay equity question. And, and so what's happening to those individuals who um, can't get a job? And so then what do they resort to? Sex work frequently. And so we need to make sure that people are able to get a job in the first place to enjoy pay equity. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to go back and clarify well, that. I would, yeah. I would add, though, sex work is legitimate work, at least in my, my, my opinion, right? It might be considered an illegitimate sort of workforce. That, by, not, by, not, not, not an illegitimate. I'm saying I'm that not, people resort to that because they can't get a right. job. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I think I must have missed right. sort of heard right. at, at the, the original sort of construction of the sentence. Which Sabri is, Sabrina, I have a question I, for you. You work with a lot of corporations and businesses, and we're, we're talking. Gonna, we're talking about um, <laughs> and nonprofit organizations yes. too, but we're talking a lot about the state legislative mm -hmm. policy arena. Let's talk about corporate and business policy. Yeah. How gender inclusive are our corporate and local businesses? Well, you know, I've seen. I, I'm born and raised here in Las Vegas, and I've worked within the nonprofit community for 20 years, and I've been out and proud for 20 years. Um, and so I've seen this shift in, in acceptance and, and, and I think it, look, I think it's great that these big corporations and especially here in hospitality, that they make their logos rainbows and that they participate in pride parades. But we also need to look at the climate within these, within these big, huge corporations and what they really are doing for their employees because are they, uh, are the climates within those organizations welcoming and affirming? Because if they're not doing that and they're not doing inclusivity trainings with the staff and, and with their, the people who are higher up in the administration, if they're not doing those things, then it doesn't matter if they have a rainbow sticker on their logo. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that I do with when I do trainings is that we have to look at all aspects of the workplace. We have to look at the safety. We need to look at their policies. And when we talk about policy and what, what Todd is talking about, we need to look at the Equality Act because that's one of the things right now that I think it's great that, that we've passed it. In the House, um, you know, we'll see what happens with the Senate. But this is a bill that states that we are we're going to protect people according to their gender identity and their sexual orientation. Because still, you can still be fired for these things, right? You can still face discrimination for these things. And this is a right to work state. So I could be fired for being gay as long as I'm not told I'm being fired for being gay, right? And so there's still a lot of folks who are still very um, nervous, especially if they work in corporate America. As to and I've had a lot of friends who've had very high-paying jobs in hospitalities who know 
that they were fired for their gender identity or for being openly trans. Uh, but as long as they don't say that, then it's not illegal, right. right? As long as the employer doesn't say that. And so, yeah, with these big corporations, they still have a long way to go, if you, you know, to be honest. Meta, let's talk more about the, the Equal Rights Amendment then. It, if it passes, what will it do to Nevada? The Equal Rights Amendment, as it was introduced um, for the second time this year, it um, enshrines in our Constitution equality for people based on gender and gender identity. And um, it's... It... it because it's a constitutional amendment, it has this kind of umbrella effect of ensuring that any policies that we pass moving forward have to be viewed through that lens. And so any policy that we want to implement that is supposed to help, you know, to help any group of people does that in a way that's non-discriminatory. And um, I think that's kind of the, the crux of the Equality Act or the um, ERA, as, as we call it in the, in the legislature. John, let's talk a little bit about higher education. Where we are, are we seeing uh, similar gaps in, in what enrollment looks like or what uh, completion rates look like? We are seeing more women uh, enter into college uh, and higher numbers uh, than we've seen. Uh, we're seeing more uh, women graduate, I think even statistically higher than men. We're seeing more non uh, gender non-conforming folk, more trans folk. We're seeing more out folk, though not necessarily saying people have to be out, but saying that we are seeing more, uh, in, and I think that has to do with time. I think it has to do with a little bit of uh, somewhat safer space. I don't want to call it safe, mm. uh, but safer. Um, and I do think it's uh, around a number of of, and I, you know, we, I think we think folks always talk about policies and rules being changed. I, I like to think about people on the ground forcing policy to change for them, right? And I like to think that it's been a number of student organizations that have forced universities to open itself up in ways that it hasn't decades and generations prior to, right? And these would be your ethnic studies or, I mean, your ethnic uh, groups, or your black studies, your your Latinx studies, right? Your your your, your Asian, Asian, M, uh, not studies, I'm sorry, organizations on campus. These would be your, 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 uh, LGBTQ plus organizations on campus that are literally forcing universities to open up. However, I would still add that the universities are still very slow to move because while there are lots of graduates, uh, not lots of, but there are more graduates, while there are more numbers um, and there are spaces, that doesn't mean that everyone is completely safe, right? We have a number of orgs on UNLV's campus, for, for example, but we have seen trans misogyny uh, rampant in this last academic year, right? We have seen particularly black and brown women and women identified folk be attacked on campus in various ways be that verbal some even uh, physical jo um, Javon, we have to be honest about that and, and and those conversations are necessary and what do you what do you attribute that to why 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 the change uh, the change in what part the 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 numbers that we're seeing an uptick in I think again I think it's student orgs right like I I don't I I'm always hesitant to champion an institution without <laughs> looking at boots on the ground right mm -hmm. and I do think it's student orgs as students are brilliant at saying I want a thing to change and and it's often high-ranking admin that are often slow to that change right um, and you know there have been moments as as a professor I've gotten credit and I'm always going I simply advise the group that did the work. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. And I yeah. think, if I can jump in, yeah, I think that is so important um, that we recognize that leadership is a two-way street. Um, what people in positions of power project onto the people who they're supposed to be leading, they should also have reflected back on them. And mm -hmm. I think that that's something that we tried really hard in this last legislative session to, to think about and also to foster um, better conversations because there are some things that you just cannot accomplish through a rule or through a policy mm -hmm. or through a law. You can't mm -hmm. make people get along. You can't make them like each other. <laughs> you can't make up their minds for them. But what you can do is you can develop um, a pattern and a practice of being inclusive and being thoughtful and being forward thinking so that, um, you know, when I was in the legislature, when I was in that building, people knew if they came to my office and they said to me that there was something in this bill that had a particular effect on the trans community, that I was going to listen to them because I showed them time and time again that I was thinking about them. And if I wasn't, I would take their concern seriously. Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of conversations that people have to be prepared to have. And, um, whether that resulted in a change to that bill or the death of that bill or or we just decided that the problem 
um, was not going to come to a head, the fact that we were able to have the conversation set the tone for the next time that someone could say, there are people in this building who care what I think and who acknowledge who I am and um, want to do right by my community. And that's not something that you put into a policy. So Sabrina, legislative conversation, conversation on university campuses. Mm -hmm. How about community conversation? What Do we have the right platforms within our community to have these kinds of conversations and be able to share very, very, a lot of times uh, varying viewpoints here? Well, you know, my, my approach, I mean, I'm an activist. I've been an activist my whole life. I'm an agitator. I don't even say I'm an activist anymore. <laughs> I'm a professional agitator. And, you know, I believe in that whole concept of there isn't made, space made for you, you make that space. Mm -hmm. You get in there because we can't be complicit and just be background noise anymore. And so I agree with you when you say it's the student orgs that have made that, who, who have pushed that, who have, have shifted that. It is always the oppressed, marginalized communities that demand that change and that that ripples to our governments and that, that ripples to corporate America and things like that, but we have to do that. Um, are there spaces here to allow for that? Yeah, I, I've seen a huge shift in Nevada and I've seen, I've seen um, places we're able to have these rallies and to, to have that and people are listening. And I do think now, I'm very thankful that we have elected officials who are, who are listening. And um, I work for a 5013C, so I have to be very careful what I say politically, <laughs> uh, but I will let you know who supports us and I will let you know that when bills are going through, how that does affect our community and the language in those bills matters. So, you know, when we say things like bills to protect LGBT folks, I always want to press and say, but you know what? We can't just say trans folks. We need to say um, trans e expansive or gender diverse because if we just say trans, we're not talking about non-binary right. folks. We're not talking about folks like myself who are gender non-conforming. We need to broaden those definitions so we're protecting all of those communities. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I, I do see that more and more and more. I don't think we're at where like Los Angeles is. I don't think we're in those very progressive spaces, but we're getting there, and I'm thankful for that. What is it that we're missing? Um, I think a lot of times, and this is this is this is just my opinion. A lot of times, we're just okay with hearing the gay voice, and we're not <laughs> hearing gay voices of color. And by the way, the gay voice is not just one gay voice. We don't have one agenda. All of us, we do well get together on Sunday for brunch and go over it. But we all have different needs, and we all have different goals. And so, for me, you know, as a queer woman, um, you know, my voice is different. So we need to bring everybody to the table. And to be diverse we need to hear about when you're talking about trans women of color but we also need to hear about trans men and their issues and we all need to have equal because we all have a stake in it but we need to have uh, equal um, I, I guess access to that and to media and those and if we don't then those of us who do have it need to step back and allow for other people to say those things and to to have, uh, have access to our elected officials so that they can hear that as well Todd, one key thing you think that could bring greater understanding to, to this topic? So I, I, something that we've been talking about is where public policy meets the road and how that affects people and individuals. And so we saw in the 2017 session, SB 225, we tried to get that implemented between the, the sessions. Which was the, the anti-bullying. The anti-bullying, trans-inclusive, gender identity, non-conforming um, policy that would require all the school districts to provide a safe space for those kids. And so it literally took up until almost the start of this session in 2019 to get that implemented. Clark County had taken the lead on it, and then the Department of Education followed, but only passed the policy in December, just before the new session. Yeah. And so we saw almost two years of, of public effort with gender justice and other advocacy organizations, the ACLU, PLAN, and others that had to come together to apply that public pressure to make sure that those kids are going to be protected. Unfortunately, what we saw happen right after that was in Elko County, where the school district then passed a policy that said any child who is um, identifying um, trans or otherwise has to go to the bathroom of their um, the birth sex. And so that's something that we're going to have to fight and continue to fight to make sure that that policy um, is followed because we see also in Washoe County where now sex education is having carve outs that won't include LGBTQ youth. So we're going to have to continue to fight these battles and make sure that on the local level that the ordinances and the school board policies are reflective of the state policies that exist. Melanie, we're going to close with you. Upcoming 81st legislative session, what are we going to see? Well, you're going to see a lot of us back um, for round 81. And um, I think that we're going to keep continuing to work for Nevada's families and for Nevada's um, working folks that deserve access to health care and access to insurance and access to um, to uh, transparency in, in drug prices as well as um, 
a workplace that's free from discrimination and workplace violence. And I think that we're going to continue to move forward in trying to expand our criminal justice reforms and that we're going to keep working on uh, something we haven't even touched on yet, which um, I, I'm a little bit surprised is um, climate justice and ensuring mm. that uh, we, we have some earth left to pass on mm. to, to this next generation because that's also something that disproportionately affects uh, people of color and communities of color that live closer to um, major sources of pollutants and um, whose water sources are more often um, impure. And so we'll keep working on those issues next and, session. And a topic for another show, for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you, as always, for joining our discussion on Nevada Week. And we're going to continue this discussion on our Nevada Week extras. So please visit our website to view this continuing conversation or watch this episode again or access resources that we've discussed on the show. Also, if you have a topic or issue that you'd like us to explore on Nevada Week, we'd always love to hear from you. So please find us on social media or email us at nevadaweek at vegaspbs.org. Thank you again, and I'll see you on the next Nevada Week. <laughs>